Caitlin, you are also welcome to admit people as you see them coming in. Okay, thank you so much.
Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we promise that you get a chance to rest a little bit, and then we can get ready. There are still quite a few uh, folks who are going to be joining us. So I just wanted to be sure uh, that we will open the uh, Zoom, um, you know, continuously until 9, uh, probably 45 or so. So people will be able to do that. I just wanted to, again, uh, thank you and welcome all of you for joining us today. My name is Lynn Crowley, and I will, um, you know, be acting as your MC today. Uh, I am also one of the co-chair of the EPIC South Puget Sound, which stands for Asian Pacific Islanders Coalition South Puget Sound Chapter. Uh, uh, chapter is part of a nonpartisan coalition that promotes the equitable access to culturally competent and linguistically accessible health and human services, uh, economic development for small businesses, civil and human rights, equal access to education, and all other concerns that impact APIs. Uh, we really like to encourage and promote civic participation of Asian Pacific Americans and in the electoral and public policy process, as well as all other things that are going to impact uh, all of us. Uh, we are very grateful to have this opportunity to collaborate with so many of you, uh, so many nonprofit organizations to put on today's event. Uh, we also want to express our thanks to, of course, all of our speakers and presenters and the planning committee members who have contributed funding as well as all kinds of support to this event. We really appreciate the generosity of all of you. Uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather may be different due to the fact we are from different parts of Washington state, as well as from this country, because we have some presenters from the East Coast. And I respectfully invite each of you to reflect upon the land on which you sit. As we start talking today, I want to be sure that we can think about the people on whose land we are standing. We need to listen uh, to each other to speak about our experiences because we are the authorities on our own histories and we also need to pay our respect to those who have provided opportunities for all of us. We want to thank uh, you, of course, all of you who are participants of this event for taking time to share what you think, what it means to be a leader while registering for this event. We hope you will find today's event to be stimulating and inspiring to add to whatever the skills and resources you may find interesting in learning. Some of you have uh, shared that a leader treats every person on their team with respect and dignity. Others say a leader allows for collaboration and values the input and work of others on the team. A leader is willing to innovate and try new ideas to meet the need of their community. And others also said a leader has clear, honest, and kind communications and is open to listening and learning. A leader has a strong vision and sense of purpose. And a leader energize actions and passion. We really think that we are all going to be uh, our own leaders before we can lead others. So today we are very happy to have an opportunity to introduce you to some of those great leaders uh, that were willing to share their experiences and uh, resources with all of us. The first one I would like to introduce is our speaker for public speaking. Since this is a skill, all of our planning committee members said 
it is a must. And we are very grateful that Representative Taylor is going to uh, lead this discussion and share her experience. Speak, um, speaking about experiences, uh, Representative Taylor is an attorney, youth advocate, and small business owner with a passion for community services and a commitment to serving the public good. She holds a bachelor's degree from Virginia State University and a law degree from University of Oregon. She launched a legal practice and nonprofit consulting firm in 2014 before later joining Northwest Justice Project in 2017. She managed a network of attorneys representing domestic violence, survivors, and other crime victims. Uh, she actually lives in Federal Way and was elected to the legislature in 2020. So it's my honor uh, to introduce you to Representative Taylor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today um, and with all of your um, leaders. Every day is an opportunity to speak in the community, whether you're speaking to your family, your neighbors, or a broader community. Um, it's nerve wracking to communicate in a way that you're maybe you feel is not your natural gift. Um, and I will tell you that it is not always natural to me. And so I'm gonna um, share some um, tips and tricks um, that I use in public speaking uh, that helps me get through the moment and the conversations. Sometimes you're compelled into giving a speech. <laughs> you're not prepared and you're nervous. And um, this is one of those days. Of course, my phone would want to ring right in the middle of my speech, but this is one of the tips that I learned. Um, uh, one of the things that I did was Google um, public speaking tips to have a guidepost to um, provide some ideas for the audience here today. And, and I want to leave you all with um, an article that you can reference later um, and, and use as your guidepost. It's 20 tips for mastering the art of public speaking that appears in Inc. Magazine. And so I'll use this as a reference point for our conversation this morning. Um, number one, you're gonna want to know your audience. And, and the, the wonderful thing about Zoom is that I get to speak in a lot of different settings and it's very similar. Uh, it, it can be nerve wracking to go in front of um, folks who look differently than you that may not know the language that you're speaking very well, um, that may not be comfortable with the topic that you are um, going to share with them today. Um, and so, understanding what audience you're going to um, speak with and what their comfort level is, is a matter of you know, doing a little prep work um, with the organizers of the event. Um, I, one other critical thing about public speaking is rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. You are rehearsing every single day. So that might mean that um, as a parent or an auntie or a mentor, you might be reading you know, aloud to your children or reading aloud to yourself. As I was growing up, what I would do was read the, the back of, um, you know, bottles of uh, shampoo and practice using what the words were on there. So, it's so, so I could learn how to say the words that are in the commercial. For example, I have this Aussie Miracle Most Moist, see, I'm having a hard time saying moist, shampoo. And I would read it, um, dry hair, looking for hydration miracle, you didn't know that I misread this, um, this label, but at the end of the day, it's about practicing and knowing how to read your script. Um, one of the challenges around that is making sure that you have your font large enough so that you're not reading you know, real close to your, your paper. So these little mechanics of helping you get through um, your materials helps. Um, the other part of practicing is getting comfortable with the words. And so uh, another way to do that is to get the book 
get a random book. Um, this one I'm reading right now for work is called Arrested Justice, Black Women, Violence, and America's Prison Nation. And so practice reading out loud to yourself or to others. Reading the, the back of the jacket, um, one of the quotes on here says, a powerful and insightful call to action, Richie offers us a richly complex yet deeply usable analysis rooted in a passionate commitment to producing knowledge that can change us and transform the world. Richie challenges us, challenges us to ask ourselves what it would mean if we were to put the lives of the most stigmatized and the most violated at the center of our social justice work. The stories of injustice, survival, and courage in these pages will stay with the reader long after reading the last page. So practicing reading the, the, the cover of the book um, is a way for you to get comfortable with words. It's one thing to see the words on the page, but it's another thing to say it out loud and be comfortable with those words. And you'll discover that there are certain words that you will always want to avoid. You might be in the medical field and there are some big words that are hard to say. For example, this year I was on the house floor and I had to read this passage. Further clarifies scope of practice issues pertaining to extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and explicitly excludes cardiopulmonary bypass. The incorporation of venous reservoirs or the cardiotomy, cardiotomy, cardiotomy. I still don't know how to say that word. Um, suction during extracorporeal membrane oxygenation therapy. I literally had to read that out loud. And I've had to Google how to pronounce extracorporeal oxygenation. And I'm a lawyer. There are words that I'm not familiar with that make me scared to read out loud in front of other people. And so I have to live into the, the notion that I'm going to be uncomfortable, but I still truck through it. You're going to find a style that works for you. It may be that you write every word down and you read it over and over to yourself. And then you read it in front of your friends and your family and you read it in when you actually give your speech. Sometimes you don't get that opportunity and you have to speak from the heart and tell your story. You might be in class giving a response to a racist comment made by one of your colleagues. That's a public speaking moment. That's a moment to give your experience. That's a moment to convey information that people need to have and advocacy. If you're a leader in the community, you are always speaking publicly. Being able to you know, have eye contact. It, as you can tell, I'm referencing notes, but I, I look down sometimes and look at the page, and then I look back up and look at the, the, um, the camera. Remember, when you're, when you're on Zoom, the camera is at the top of the, the, the window, not necessarily at the bottom of the page. Practice your tone and projection. Again, that goes back to reading the bottle of shampoo and pretending you're a commercial or reading the, the jacket of a book. I have uh, another book, Use the Power You Have, A Brown Woman's Guide to Politics and Political Change by Pramila Jayapal. I know some of you may know who she is. Through an honest reflection of her personal journey as an immigrant woman, woman of color to the corridors of power, Pramila shares dynamic lessons, dynamic lessons on how those who are often too um, too often on the margins can be the center of a revolution. You realize just by being here that you are at the center of a revolution and you can get inspired by every moment. Yes, I am promoting Pramila Jayapal's book. Yes, I'm promoting these other books. But it, the point is, is that I practice reading aloud in other settings so that I can um, use my words and get comfortable with the language. Also know your material. Sometimes you don't realize how knowledgeable you are until someone asks you a question. It's okay that you don't know every single thing about a topic. You know your lived experience and how you're receiving the information and how you're sharing it with others. And, and lastly, mentally prepare yourself for giving a speech at all times, at all moments. Sometimes it means taking time to be 
totally quiet before um, giving your, your comments. Sometimes you have to gather yourself because you're angered and you want to be very um, assertive about what you need to say. And I, and I say reactionary because a lot of times we are confronted with things that are very difficult in our lives and difficult with um, folks who are in our work settings. And you have to convey information that uh, shows that um, you should be respected. Uh, and so that, that is part of, I think, the, the public speaking world that I live in, mostly because I'm an advocate. I need for folks to know that there is a, another lived experience, a, def, a different um, point of view, and opportunities to share more about my passions, my, my belief systems, and my community with others. And, and that, that helps us you know, build community as a whole. And public speaking is essential for leadership and, and it doesn't have to be something that you fear and it doesn't have to be something that you do exactly as you see Barack Obama uh, do it or Jamila Taylor do it or Cindy Rayu do it um, in, in other uh, settings. Um, you will find a style that works for you if you practice and you get comfortable with it. Don't shy away from opportunities to do your public speaking and find um, ways to be as comfortable with that process and go forth and do good. <laughs> Sometimes you, you might be at a loss for words in the middle of your speech, but you will get through it and, and know that you have grace and appreciation for just stepping up into your leadership and stepping into places of helping folks understand who you are and what information you want to convey. So thank you so much for your time this morning. I look forward to engaging with you in the future. Thank you so much, Representative Taylor. Really appreciate your advice there. Uh, we are going to just kind of continuously share with you each of the presenters. Uh, who are going to be talking about five different topics, which you already saw earlier in our, uh, you know, introduction slides. So the next speaker I'd like to introduce to you is for our enacting change through legislation. And the person who is going to be speaking on that is our representative Cindy Rui. Cindy is serving her sixth term in the Washington State House of Representatives. Uh, she has served as a Shoreline City Council member, as a mayor, and become the first Korean American woman mayor. And she has chaired the Community and Economic Development Committee with jurisdiction over community development, community investment program, and underrepresented communities. So all of this different work experience has enabled her to serve on the appropriation and consumer protection and business committees with a great zest. She was on the uh, Washington Tourism Marketing Authority Board and also a delegate for Pacific Northwest Economic Regions. Uh, she currently chairs the Board of Women in Government, which serves the nearly 2,300 women state legislator in the USA. So it's my honor again to introduce you to Representative Cindy. Thank you so very much, Lynn. Representative Taylor, thank you so very much. I, as I am not a natural speaker, I took notes. I still have lots to learn. And also as an Asian, I had to practice making those eye contacts that you uh, emphasize. So, uh, and um, I had to do something because as I was finishing grad school a long time ago, um, I was finding, uh, uh, even as I was getting trained to be a business leader, I was having a hard time speaking up, uh, even in class. And I thought, you know, as a leader, I need to learn how to uh, speak. And so I found the local Toastmasters Club and that helped quite a bit. So um, as Lynn mentioned, um, I serve both in local and state go government. Um, and being a politician was nothing that I had thought about until I was in my middle age. 
going way back to uh, when I was born. I was born in Korea. I lived in Brunei and then Manila. And then we came to America in my sixth grade because my parents wanted opportunities to work and public ed education for my three brothers and me. So I worked for the city of Seattle before, after a whole bunch of other jobs. And then I became an insurance agent for 24 years. And as I became involved with the local Shoreline Chamber of Commerce and actively engaged for the Aurora Avenue revitalization project in Shoreline about 18 years ago, I decided to run for city council and then eventually for state legislature. And let me tell you, I didn't win all of those races, but uh, here I am, uh, one of the more senior members of the legislature, at least in the House Democratic Caucus. So I, uh, I am uh, serving my sixth term and will be running. Uh, I guess I can't say that, but I will be running I will be around for quite a while more. Let me just put it that way. And I do chair the Community and Economic Development Committee. So how did I, or where did I learn um, uh, how important that decision-making power is? Actually, it wasn't in politics or even at the city council meetings. It was actually as a church member. I was a long-term church volunteer spending, I believe about 17 years. I had three kids as a, a preschool and as the children's ministry volunteer. And uh, I am also a wife of an ordained minister. Uh, and what I figured out was that the elders in session in the Presbyterian church, they made all the policy decisions as well as they control the church budget. So when I fought for the children's um, uh, meals or snacks, I had to make do with a dollar a meal per kid. It was a while ago, so it was doable, but there were a lot of chicken nuggets. So um, just like the elders at church, politicians are the ones who make the policies and all the taxing and funding decisions, at least at the state level, right? And so I think that's why I was invited to speak about effective legislation, uh, because that's how we make the policies and, and also even how we pass the various budgets. So I'll give you a couple of examples, maybe three. Um, the first big one is one that uh, Representative Taylor and I, we lived through because she serves on my committee. Um, and it is the Public Broadband Act, House Bill 1336. Fortunately, it took effect. It was touch and go for quite a while, but it took effect in July. And it is to help ensure that families and businesses throughout Washington State have access to high speed internet. And so now, finally, Washington State joins the majority of states that allow unrestricted public broadband. And it will help. It will take a while, but it will help people across the state to have cheaper and better options for internet access. And so how did that get started? Uh, I didn't sponsor it. I just had to help shepherd it so that it passed. And of course, I had Representative Taylor's support in her vote. So uh, the prime sponsor, he uh, identified uh, or he was brought a problem. Somebody, a port, uh, pointed out to him that, uh, and we all knew this, uh, we have a lack of broadband infrastructure infrastructure for many, even for those of us who live in metropolitan areas. So what was the problem? What do we need to improve? Uh, he and the advocates decided public broadband retail service, which was pro prohibited in Washington state was the, one of the problems. So what was the context or the urgency? It's obviously the pandemic that ne necessitated, not just made it nice, but necessitated remote learning and remote work and remote meeting, just like we are here. And uh, who would benefit? Well, many would with increased access and affordability. So what were the uh, potential solutions? Of course, he took the bull by the horn and uh, uh, introduced a bill that made us have public uh, internet. And what I found um, as a 11 year, veteran of this process and before that four years on the city council because we also have 
uh, process at the local level through ordinances of enacting legislation was that, yes, definitely uh, have your initial idea of what the solution could be. Definitely hold on to that idea and be passionate about it, but be willing to accept changes or maybe what I would euphemistically call improvements, right? So uh, his goal was allow unrestricted public broadband in Washington state. And I agreed with him. So that helped because I was the chair. I got to hear the bill or schedule the bill and schedule the moving of it and twist a few people's arms. I didn't have to twist any of the Democrats' arms, but at least not in the House. When it was in the Senate, it was a little more touch and go, go there, but we got it done. So you have to also identify who the stakeholders are. Uh, he, they obviously, the advocates obviously found an engaged and an excited, very excited prime sponsor that Representative Hansen is. And so he listened to his local port and he worked closely, not only to draft the initial bill, but throughout the entire amendment process. And there were lots of efforts to amend the bill. Uh, and even I had to help with that uh, swatting away of bad ideas and uh, anyway, keeping it as whole as possible. And they, uh, as, a, as a unit, I guess, because they were kind of joined at the hips for it's quite a few weeks, they did a fantastic job of outreach. Fortunately, it was a virtual session, so they didn't all crowd into many, many um, uh, rooms, hearing rooms, but more than 1,400 people signed in with their own opinions. Fortunately, and much more fortunately, most of them were pro, a few were con, and then of course of others who might have had concerns. Um, so I listened to everyone who wanted to speak and it was almost 50 of them. And it was definitely exciting hearing. And obviously everyone came very passionate with the values, their ideology. Um, they describe who the beneficiaries would be by how much and in what ways. And Opponents also spoke quite a bit, they, uh, and so we had to negotiate really hard with them. And some of them were uh, understandably private service private uh, providers who thought that it was a zero sum game and they thought they would lose out, which was not the goal at all. And even another uh, sponsor of another competing legislation. So you have to know what, who the opponents are and those, the questions are what I literally ask uh, members who want me to schedule the bills. Hey, do you know who your uh, proponents are? And it's pretty obvious. And then also, who are your opponents? What should I be aware of? Because I hate being caught off guard, especially as the chair. And then, of course, you have to look at who must take those actions. Because we are bicameral, we have to have the House members, or at least the majority of us, vote for it, which we did. Every single Democrat plus a few Republicans voted for, for it at least two times. And then also the Senate, not as much unified there, but we got it through. And then, of course, the governor. He has the option of uh, vetoing the bill uh, or partially vetoing the bill or signing the bill. And he did sign the bill with a partial veto, um, but it was fine. It, we still kept the, uh, the integrity of most of it. Uh, so we got to the goal and it got uh, signed into law and it's in effect now. So we also have to not only think about who the actors are, but also after the bill is signed, who has to implement that policy change? As good as it could, it can be, if it's not implementable, it's not a good bill or a good policy change. And so uh, Representative Hansen um, uh, engaged the agency quite early, the State Broadband Office, the Department of Commerce, and even the Governor's Office. And actually, they ended up becoming one of our strong allies in staying true and and forging ahead. And of course, local governments uh, um, and public entities such as the ports, they brought the bill, but sometimes they don't. But for other bills, we have to make sure that 
everyone who we expect to implement and make the bill or the policy a success is, um, even if they have objections, that they are voicing their opinions. So uh, the so as a uh, MBA student who's um, up, uh, whose concentration was in operations management, I always look at the functionality and the future operation of any bill and the functional application. So even though all the conflicting interests and they were strong and mighty <clears throat> from January through April of this year, the one thing that all the legislators agreed on was that we do not have enough state funds to build out our state's broadband infrastructure. And so the overarching point that I pointed out over and over was how we do, how do we get ready to draw down eventually as much of the federal investment dollars as possible by both private entities as well as future public internet providers. And who, who knew, <laughs> we knew that the, uh, uh, Fed, uh, the our uh, uh, congressional members are working on that particular issue right now. So uh, that was a good example and we got it passed within a year, within one session, which was like, anyway, it was amazing. A second example, much shorter, briefer example is one that I sponsored, which is on soju licensing and uh, enforcement. Um, soju is a distilled alcohol, unlike the brewed Japanese sake. And many people didn't understand that. I did because I am one of the very few dry caucus members who does not support alcohol expansion. And yet I had heard of the challenges of enforcement and I was aware of the cultural practices both in South Korea as well as in Washington state. So for apparently, I didn't know this, but they say for about 20 years, uh, soju manufacturers, distributors, restaurant owners, especially Korean restaurant owners, they wanted this bill to pass. So finally, uh, they uh, hired a, a very effective lobbyist who approached me. Chris Mar said, we need to get this done, Cindy. And I said, do you know who I am? I'm a tri member. And he said, I know but can we work this through? So I said, one of my biggest, um, uh, one of the few times I do vote on liquor bills, for liquor bills is when it increases enforcement or makes it much safer for people. And every once in a while, if it's helpful in economic development and especially for the small businesses. I mean, look at the title of my committee, right? And so uh, uh, very early on, we engaged the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board. And very fortunately, uh, one of the employees, Kim Sauer, who is also Korean American and very familiar with this issue. And I believe she's the historian there. She knew about it for the 20 years. I had recently been aware of it. And uh, other than um, uh, grocery and uh, even restaurant owners accosting me and saying, hey, Cindy, do something. And it's like, what? <laughs> and they didn't have practical ideas, but Kim did. And so did Chris Marr. And so we struck a balance of commitments from the manufacturer, the distributor, to educate the servers. Um, we also got agreement from the board uh, the uh, LCB that uh, a very affordable license, very narrow and uh, affordable license would increase the likelihood of compliance. And by the way, it would make enforcement much, much easier because we made sure that the bottle stayed on the table because that's how the wives counted how many bottles the husbands were drinking on in the table over away from the wives, right? And so that way um, they, they could also see who was being served because of that unique color of that bottle. So it was definitely um, uh, 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 a win-win for everyone. And I believe uh, Kim did such a good job and with everyone's help that even before the law became law, basically everyone got their license and they were ready to start from day one. 
So um, as you can, so those are two very successful examples, but uh, it is much easier to kill a bill than to pass it. Sometimes it takes more than one session to pass a bill. Those two were very unique examples. Um, and in fact, I have been introducing permanent cosmetic bills over about seven different years and it has yet to pass. So there are still very passionate issues that many of us are working on that do not, um, they get the hearing because we have relationships with our chairs, but don't necessarily get out of the house or get out of the Senate. So if that happens, what are the alternatives? There's sometimes very few instances where there might be rulemaking options at the agency level. And so another reason um, to get to know who the, uh, who the implementers are, as well as, of course, who the action active members will be to pass a bill. Um, and then uh, if it still doesn't work, then can we fund for instance, a task force or a study through a budget proviso. And when, as, as long as we're not in really, really tight, dire straits budget wise, typically a lot of uh, the members get to introduce provisos and especially if they're very reasonable and if we made a good case for it, we actually get the funding. And um, of course, it is always about the timing. For instance, next session is a 60-day session versus the 105 long session that we just had. And it was a very productive, even though very difficult uh, a virtual session, it was a very productive session. So you can imagine, especially for new members who never had an in-person session, we, if we are to go either in-person or virtual or some sort of a hybrid, how challenging it would be to have just 60 days to pass a bill. And remember, it's not just the House, it's also the Senate, and also convincing the governor to sign the bill and not veto it. So a uh, sense of the timing, um, um, another sense of it is how as a community and as legislators, we can build up to a very critical moment. And so for instance, police accountability bills. We passed so many of them this past session. And um, where I got involved was way back in 2016, five years ago, a long time ago, before COVID-19. Um, I was aware of the difficulties and the struggles we were having at that time. So I ended up introducing House Bill 2908. And it was, uh, it didn't change any of the laws at all. Instead, it established the Joint Legislative Task Force on Community Policing Standards for Safer Washington. And so fast forward a few years later, we had the 2020 year, not just COVID-19, but also a major uh, year where a, a lot of us became much more aware, but also felt the urgency through the Black Lives Matter and then uh, movement. And then the 2021 session, finally, we had a full one third or 19 of the 57 House Democratic members who are members of color with huge increases in the Black Caucus membership. And so after literally hundreds of hours, maybe even thousands of hours of work by various legislators and staff members, we passed a historic number of police accountability bills. And so I guess the bottom line is do your homework, but definitely don't give up. It might take a few years and it's definitely a team. Uh, and so I'm finishing up. I'm almost done. I know uh, 20 minutes is a long time without a, video, uh, without a visual to look at. So the bottom line, please... Um, keep at it, uh, find passionate people, whether they're legislators or advocates, and continue to build that community. And whether you are the one who's speaking on it or doing all the back, uh, uh, backup work, because that's also very important, don't give up and keep um, advocating for yourself and for your community. Thank you very much.
So yeah. uh, my name is Samad Aidan, and um, I am uh, a, uh, a cross-cultural leadership um, coach and trainer and researcher. Um, I'm at the moment uh, doing research on how to um, apply an equity lens on how uh, projects, especially infrastructure projects, um, are, uh, are selected, are planned, and are executed, and how these infrastructure projects can improve uh, the way that they interact with communities and especially how they impact communities of color. Uh, so my presentation is going to be about um, how we as employees in different organizations can improve uh, can, can create more inclusive spaces within our organizations. And I want to uh, share with you three main points. One is as employees, as leaders uh, in your organization, um, there are three things that I want to share with you, which is first, know your, your value, leverage the power that you already have, uh, and then drive change, systemic change. So I'm going to focus on um, I'm going to focus on first knowing your value. So as an employee working in an organization, especially uh, as a leader of color, you are now um, you have so much power at this point because there is so much pressure on organizations uh, to uh, to be more uh, inclusive and more equitable. Customers are demanding it. Um, especially younger generations. Surveys are showing that younger customers are more willing to buy products that benefit the environment or society. They expect companies they do business with, they buy from, to stand, to take a stand on important issues. Um, for employees, uh, employees that are looking for jobs, they are saying that a diverse workforce within an organization is an important factor they consider when they are looking for jobs. Employers should be doing more to promote inclusion. That's the expectations of, of talent that, is, that, is, that have choice and have leverage now to go and work anywhere. They're, they want to make sure that the organization they associate themselves with uh, stand for equity. Racial equity is more is the most important workplace issue today, according to survey by, uh, of employees. More importantly, public and private investors they are also expecting organizations to stand for equity, to take action, to be more inclusive, especially on racial equity. Companies should disclose annual data. These are the expectations from investors. They need to expose the, uh, the to to expose and disclose the composition of their workforce by race and ethnicity. Companies should also make progress on increasing the diversity of these, their works. So what are companies doing right now to respond to these pressures internal and external? They are looking to you as a leader that's already working for them to advise them, to help them. They want you to, as a subject matter expert on, on communities of color, on a lived experience, of, of uh, communities of color to, to help them and to, uh, to provide your expertise and your know-how uh, and your commitment. So, so how do you leverage your power? First, make sure that you are harnessing the power of existing uh, structures within the organizations. Organizations now are turning to what is referred to as employee resource groups and diversity councils. They are encouraging the creation of these structures. Sometimes organizations are doing this because they genuinely want uh, to understand how they need to change. Sometimes they're doing these changes just so that they can check the box. But as an employee, as a leader, if you are asked to be part of these structures, do not join just so that you can endorse something that is just made for to check the box. Make sure that you genuinely um, push your organizations to be to mean it, to mean when they say we are really interested in, in, in developing these resource, employee resource groups. So first of all, let me do a quick definition of what do we mean by employee resource groups. They are voluntary. They tend to, they are 
led uh, the, uh, by employees, they could be based on identity, on a shared identity or a shared experience. They serve as a resource for their, for their member employees and they help employees with an, within an organization to build community and share a common cause, but they also uh, serve as a catalyst for promoting diverse, inclusive workplace that aligns with the vision and core values of the organization, or at least what the organization um, strives to be. So, um, so leverage these, these structures, um, employee resource groups and diversity councils, especially employee resource groups can be based on race, they could be uh, uh, based on religion, uh, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, disability, uh, social and economic causes, shared interests. For example, uh, companies uh, have uh, women's networks, uh, networks of people of color. So there's African-American leaders groups, African-American uh, um, employees groups, Latinx groups, uh, Asian-American groups. So make sure that if your organization doesn't have these uh, employee resource groups, then one of the first things to do is to advocate for the creation of these structures uh, so that A, you can speak from within uh, uh, within a group of, of people that have a, a shared commitment, a shared experience. More importantly, advocate for the creation of these resource groups for all these types of characteristics or identities or lived experiences. Why? Because the more solidarity we have among ourselves, the more solidarity, the more we are able to affect change. So I shouldn't just be working just within my group. So if I were, uh, for example, I'm a Muslim American. So um, my interest in working with my Muslim, in Muslim uh, employer resource groups, uh, it's not sufficient. I must reach out and, and support other resource groups when they are doing their uh, their uh, campaigns, when where they are pushing for certain um, uh, rights or certain changes, because that solidarity lifts everybody. As we have seen, we are all affected by the impact of exclusions. Um, and so, um, so why is it that I focus on you as a as a leader within your organization to work within these existing structures. Because you have to differentiate between advocacy and activism that you do outside of the organization versus the one you do inside your organization. And here is why. We all have careers and we all have families to feed and it is not helpful to anybody if in the process of advocating you get you get um, um, uh, marginalized yourself or you get categorized as somebody who is difficult or somebody who is a problem. Depending on where your organization is in that evolution and its spectrum, you know, uh, or its, uh, um, yeah, about its evolution, at the early phases, those people who are advocates, who are activists tend to be, uh, um, sometimes attacked and tends to be sometimes marginalized and excluded and labeled. We don't want you to, to, to experience that because then you're not gonna be effective. Make sure to use existing structures, work within the existing power structures. This gives you power. You add your voice to the other voices. You work with other employee resource groups. And so you are part of a very strong voice and then you can affect change. If you are the only one working outside of these structures and you are advocating and you think that by advocating within your organization, you can talk in the same way, you can use the same language as you do outside, certain organization will value that and you can make change. But in certain organization, as we know, that could render you to be very ineffective um, and so therefore we want you to be efficient and effective. And these structures, whether you are, whether you see an advertisement of uh, employee resource groups that's being created or a diversity council, or, the, or you are being asked to attend uh, some kind of committee or be part of those committees, make sure that those have teeth, that these structures have power, that they have 
uh, a role that is acknowledged and then add your voice. If they don't exist, then advocate for the creation of them. So make that distinct differ the differentiation between your advocacy efforts outside of your organization and within your organization, because we want you to make change. We just don't want you to get shot at in the process. All right. So how do you assert your voice? All right. You assert your voice by looking at what your organization is doing at, with three layer, in three layers or three dimensions. Most organizations are focusing right now on the workplace. They are training people. They are trying to change their hiring processes. They are trying to develop uh, leaders of color. They are trying to make inclusion uh, part of their processes. They're advancing and making sure to retain employees of color to create more diversity. But that's not enough. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. Unfortunately, your organization may be, that's all they're doing. So you need now to expand their definition of what inclusion means. It means how do they show up in the marketplace? What kind of products are they making? What kind of services are they making? Are those inclusive? Are those including uh, uh, people of color, historically disenfranchised communities? What about their sales and marketing? Are those culturally responsive? Are those reaching those communities? So if you're working, for example, for a local government agency, are their services tend to be only marketed to historically privileged communities, white communities, dominant communities? Is their messages and languages and, and ways of, uh, of showing up all geared towards uh, ben, uh, attracting or, or marketing to the same communities? you have an opportunity to look holistically and from a systemic perspective at how your organization is reaching and inclus uh, being inclusive. What, what do they buy and where do they buy it from? This is procurement and supply chain. Are they buying from the same people? Are they saying one thing about inclusion, but then they continue to buy from the same big, large one vendor? Uh, and then they have the opportunity to buy from small, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, businesses that are, you know, uh, minority-owned businesses or, or buy from communities of colors or create projects within communities of colors, are they really walking the walk um, or just doing the talk? Who are they al building alliances with? Who are they partnering with? Who are they doing joint ventures with? From a business perspective, do uh, are they doing, is your organization doing that in the spirit of that inclusive uh, and equitable way, and they're and we're, and can aligned with how they talk about equity and inclusion. And then we want to look again at what your organization is doing out there in society. What kind of policies are they advocating for, and are they paying lobbyists for? Uh, so you can they can say something in their mission statement, but where are they spending their money? How are they pressuring representatives such as the ones we have here? How are they pressuring them uh, to make policies that are either serving communities of color? How are they funding or, 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 or giving donations or, go, or giving support or giving campaign contributions to representatives that are, that are out there in the front lines um, fighting for equity? Or are they saying one thing internally, but then their money is going to to, to campaigns and to representatives that are actually working against our communities. And what about their, their philanthropy? Where are they spending their money on philanthropy? What are they sponsoring? So you can begin to see the, you know, when there is incongruence, when there is a misalignment. And you, this is why it is so important to work within structures. Because if you just stand there in a meeting or in a town hall or a lunch and learn and start um, challenging, and pushing back, you know, and everybody is looking at you, you know, and people who you are exposing in a way, you know, uh, will feel attack, will, will, will have a way to, to try to protect themselves. And so you may not be affected by, you know, how you choose to speak your voice. So give your voice power use existing governance structures, existing accountability. If they don't exist, advocate for them. This is how we can change how organizations create inclusive spaces. Um, otherwise, we are just 
you know, spending the same effort and energy on, on working to change people, to focus on individual racism, individual bias. And while that is important, it does not change the structures, the existing institutional policies and practices and body and behaviors that are actually harming our communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Samad Adeng. Um, we, we are having audio issues, I believe still with, with Lynn Crowley, so I will kind of step in here <laughs> in, in the interim. Um, I would like to, well, quick introduction. I'm Brian Locke, I'm the co-chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Coalition of South Puget Sound. Uh, with Lynn Crowley, so it's welcome everyone. Um, I, I wasn't expecting <laughs> to, to be uh, facilitating this, but uh, you know, this is what happens sometimes. And those of you who have been through Toastmasters, you know, you you, you kind of learn how to do impromptu um, presentations, and, and this is one of them. <laughs> so I am looking at the agenda, and our next speaker is. Uh, assembly member uh, Yulene Yo, uh, and please forgive me if I mispronounced your name here. Um, in, in 2016, uh, Yulene was elected to serve the 65th uh, Assembly District of New York, representing the following Lower Manhattan neighborhoods of the Lower East Side, Chinatown, South Street Seaport area, Financial District, and Battery Park. Uh, you, Yulene began working in the state policy, policy issues while in college, eventually accepting a position with the Washington State House Health Committee. I'm not sure if that's right. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, while there, she helped develop policies to expand senior access to prescription medication, improve women's health care, expand health coverage for low-income families, and she went on to later work as an advocate and organizer on anti-poverty issues, where she helped build a broad coalition to fight predatory lending and assist low-income families build financial assets. She then served as chief of staff for New York State Assembly member Ron Kim. After being elected to serve in the assembly, Yulene was has continued her advocacy work around financial empowerment. So assembly member, uh, no, can, can you uh, correct me if my introduction was, was off by a lot? So <laughs> just like the one we speak right lot. now. Thank you. Um, so actually, I uh, actually am from Washington State. So hello, everyone. I actually know a lot of familiar faces and names up in this room. Um, but I wanted to say that it's really awesome to be able to be a part of this forum. But uh, more than anything, it is amazing to be able to be a part of this community uh, and, and speak up because, you know, it's really it's really amazing to see how the different places um, have different folks like kind of stepping up in different leadership positions um, that, that I've known before, seen before, uh, met before. It's weird to hear Chris Marr's name as somebody who's like on the advocate side of things or on the lobbyist side of things because he used to be a senator when I used to be lobbying him on anti-poverty issues. So this is kind of like a really interesting kind of uh, change in dynamics for uh, how things change over time. Um, so uh, actually almost, gosh, it's almost been what, 20 years um, since I, over over 20 years since I started to work in the uh, Washington State Legislature. So I actually used to be an intern uh, for Senator Regala. She's retired now. Um, and, and then I started to staff uh, actually Eileen Cody, who's still there in Washington uh, as the healthcare chair. And so that was the one difference in my bio. Uh, I was actually, um, you know, helping her when she was already chair 
uh, you know, as her staffer. And, you know, she's still chair. <laughs> um, and she was working on at that moment when I was staffing her, when I staffed her for uh, over four years. So it's been a, it was a really long extended period of time. Um, I learned so much from her. And actually, you know, this is where uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about are going to kind of pop in. But I will echo that I am not a great public speaker. What I lack in talent, I make up with enthusiasm. So this is also how I karaoke. So <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there. But I just listened to Rep Taylor's tips and read the article that she put out. And I'm going to say that I don't follow any of those rules. <laughs> and I am the worst. I, I often am told, you know, wow, you like speak way too fast. But I'm in New York and that's just part of the speed of how we how we work you know in Seattle everybody was like you talk so fast like you're so urban and all this stuff and I was like and I didn't realize until I got here I was like oh everybody hears my speed but over in Seattle I was like I think I was just like going a mile a minute and realized that it wasn't it wasn't just me <laughs> it was it was like half of the nation but on the other side um but I just wanted to say that you know I uh I'm always trying to get a million times better. And I am not somebody who people would say is a typical leader, is a typical, um, you know, obviously not a white older male, I guess. Um, and I don't have that alpha mentality and I don't have that kind of leadership structure even in my own brain. Um, I feel like there are just so many different types of leadership. And I used to actually uh, have an incredible mentor named Uncle Bob Santos. Probably a lot of folks know him. I know it's okay to give him a couple of props up in this room. But I want to say that, you know, Uncle Bob used to tell me because I've I was always somebody who was a very background person, very shy and never willing to kind of step up, speak up or, um, you know, really kind of step forward unless somebody else was, uh, you know, being hurt by something. And then and then it was like <gasps> guns blazing, right, all, all out. But he used to tell me that it's OK that there are different types of leadership and it's awesome to have different types of leadership because, you know, you have to show that um that different kind of leadership because otherwise you won't have uh the kind of leadership that is um the special type of leadership that you are right and uncle bob was really good in that way of putting things into perspective for me um so i just wanted to say also that there are many people that will say that you know it is much harder to be recognized as a leader if you are a person of color a woman a, someone with a disability um and you know, folks don't peg me as like that usual construct of what leadership looks like. And I think that there are so many things that are um, harder, true, but there are also things that make it so that you have a different lens and there are different things that you can do to make yourself a, uh, a leader for um, the communities that are extremely underrepresented. And I think that you know, this is where I think we'll talk a lot about the networking and the communication that I'm supposed to be talking about here. And I just wanted to say that, you know, for myself, I couldn't have done the things that I wanted to do for our community without the kind of mentorship that I was able to have. So mentorship is a type of networking. Um, I think it's one of the most important types of networking. It's important to be able to be mentored <laughs> and it's also important to be a mentor. So I think that, you know, being a mentee and being a mentor are both really, really important aspects of uh, networking. I think that, you know, it the other part I'm going to talk about is about asking questions, making sure that folks are, um, you know, feeling good about asking questions. I know that for myself, um, if I didn't ask questions and if I didn't feel like I was able to ask questions, uh, that would make a lot of different things a lot harder, right? Um, and then there's a lot of different kinds of um, leadership within different places. So when I was in DC, I'm going to tell you that it was not the same kind of vibe. <laughs> and I'll tell you about that experience in just a little bit. But the other thing I wanted to talk about with networking is that, you know, you get what you give into each experience, uh, whether it's an internship or even an email exchange. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So just starting off with mentorship, um, I have had some of the best mentors in my life. Um, you know, when I was in Seattle, actually, I had probably some of the biggest mentors um, 
you know, I could ever ask for. I had, you know, Uncle Bob, I had Sharon Tomiko. She actually, um, you know, people don't, don't know this story, this backstory. And there's a reason why I call her mom and everybody knows I call her mom. But it's because, you know, when I was younger um, and I was just starting out as a young intern in uh, Washington State, I actually went... Um, and applied for that internship, not knowing anybody, not knowing anything. And I uh, just thought, wow, like I should just try this because I wanted to see what government looked like. I wanted to see what it looked like on a, on a bird's eye view kind of level. And uh, really it was to kind of break it, right? <laughs> because I felt like, you know, it, it, it was so messed up. So many different things were wrong with it. And um, it was untouchable and accessible, and I, and I felt like that. I didn't think that I could ever move it or change it. And um, when I was there, I realized very different that, um, that actually there's a lot of powers that be that don't want you to move it or change it. And so they try to make it seem like it is going to always be opaque and always going to be hard to access. But uh, I think that, you know, the thing that I learned was that we can change that very much. And my mentors taught me that. Um, so when I was waiting once at a bus stop, just waiting to be picked up for my mentorship, I actually you know, knew about Sharon because um, you know everybody knows about Sharon, but I was like so stunned when she walked towards me and was just like, we're gonna work together one day. And I was like, what? <laughs> oh my God, she's talking to me. And then, um, you know, she took me under her wing and little by little, I um, got to know her. I got to know Uncle Bob. And when I was first looking for a position after uh, I had worked for Eileen for a bit, um, she actually, you know, had taken me into her home, um, you know, helped me with my resume line by line, literally Uncle Bob made steak. <laughs> and ketchup, <laughs> added ketchup, but added ketchup to that steak. Um, but there was, uh, you know, line by line help. And she then, um, she then pulled clothes out of her own closet to uh, dress me because I didn't have the money or the uh, style <laughs> or the ability to, um, you know, get dressed for my first uh job so or my job interview and so she actually prepped me for my interview taught me how to interview and then dressed me for my interview and you know that is something that is forever life-changing and something that is also something that I try to pass on uh, constantly with my young people and the people who come and join my campaign or come and join my um, you know office or the folks that I talk to and you know make sure to lead. And I understand how hard it is to ask, and I understand how hard it is to uh, take that plunge, um, but it is also important to ask questions, right? And I think that asking for things is one of the hardest things. And so as somebody who is uh, now, you know, in a position where, you know, young people are trying to get help from me, I also, you know, know how hard it is to bridge that gap and how, to make, how, how hard it is to make that ask. And so I try to make it easier and I try to tell people that it's okay to ask, right? And I think that it's, it's, it's really important for us. Um, and so I see so many of the leaders that I, I've heard of and know of um, in this room. And I think it's really important for us to open up that uh, ability for folks to bridge that as well. And, you know, I think it's important to note that, you know, you get what you give into each experience, right? Whether it's an internship like mine, um, or if it's uh, an email exchange or anything, right? I used to tell my own organization, I would say, um, you know, I don't think it's uh, the, the form letters and I don't think that those cards are all that helpful. Um, what I think is helpful is if we get people to call in um, about their story or to write their story in letter form, right? And I used to um, tell my organization this and people got mad at me actually because people were like saying, well, you know, just having a postcard or like having these stacks of postcards or these form letters or these form emails is a way to motivate people and drive people and to move legislation legislators and move legislation. And I was like, that's not to me, um, you know, I think that it's always like you get what you give, right? And so if you're taking the time to spend that moment with somebody or to write that email um, with your personal story in it, or to handwrite a letter or to make a personal phone call, like those are things that will, you know, come back in dividends because you will also be 
you know, making that personal connection and personal touch and making it so that people will um, respond back to you in a way that is personal as well. And they will take the time and they will take the effort to give as much as you gave, right, to reply back. Um, and I think that that's like a really, really important note on how to network. I think that people don't really think of that when they're networking. They think, wow, you know, I met 300 people and I gave them all my business cards, you know, <laughs> that's networking. But in reality, I think it's about that connection and it's about that moment of uh, connecting with one another, asking questions, and then making sure that you're actually giving um, as much as you're, you know, trying to get, right? I think that's really about that moment. Um, and I wanted to say that for communication, um, it's really, really tied in, right? And I think that this is also a piece that, you know, people don't realize when they're when they're networking. And this is also something that I learned from Uncle Bob, right? That communication is not about talking. <laughs> it's about listening, actually. Communication is mostly about listening. Um, it's about uh, messaging and telling stories. Hold on. Too. Yeah. Yes. Somebody has something that they need to say? Okay, um, I think uh, that was maybe Lynn trying to get back in. But um, I wanted to uh, say that, you know, Uncle Bob was always talking about how best to um, tell stories, right? That was his big thing. That was how he communicated. That was how he led. And it was about telling stories, you know, the kiki, the <laughs> spreading the tea, you know, <laughs> um, trying to make sure that people understood um, how, uh, he, you know, he experienced something, but also listening to other people's stories, right? And I think that listening, messaging, telling stories, um, understanding where others are coming from and exchanging stories is really powerful. And then also um, to recognize that it's okay to be different and to love on that difference, right? When you're telling your story and you're listening to somebody else's story, I always think about this, even when I'm doing my policy work, that everything is super layered. And it's actually, there isn't a wrong or a right per se, most of the time, right? It's it's definitely, sometimes there are things that are wrong and sometimes there are things that are not okay, right? But I'm just saying like for policy, when you're talking about, even um, when I was regulating the predatory lending industry in Washington state, I had to think about, you know, how is it that these different products actually are needed by certain folks and what were they saying and well, how were they actually talking to these communities that use them, right? And so why is it like that folks are actually all seeing things from different lenses and different perspectives, but they're all coming from their own experience and to them, that is the perspective, right? And so when you're talking about policy, it's all really, really layered. And when you're communicating about you know, how to make that change, it's also really, really layered. And actually we heard from the professor earlier um, and he was really, really great about pulling that apart and then putting it back together again. And I think that, you know, we need to do that as people, right? When we're communicating our stories and when we're understanding one another and that's really about how we communicate too. It's okay to be different. It's okay to understand that, you know, my lens is different from your lens, but maybe they're both right, right? And to understand where everybody's coming from and then build bridges right? If you're building those bridges, then you're also making that connection and you're also making that communication. And so I think that those are the different ways that you can network and communicate and make things a lot stronger for your leadership style. And for my leadership style, it's like, it, it, it's, it's always been about making sure that it's coming from a servant leadership standpoint. And so that's why for, for me anyway, when I'm telling stories or when I'm talking about like my own constituents and, you know, a, a little earlier, Cindy was talking about how she makes legislation. And for me, like my legislation, legislation always comes from listening to my community and like just talking to folks and then not a single one of my bills does not come from the story that my constituents did not tell me right and so like I think that every single bill comes from a story that they told me from their experience and I'm looking at the problem from their lens and I'm also looking at it from my own lens and I'm looking at it from other people's lenses and I try to see how is it that we can solve all of the different issues that come together and you know make this an, an issue and a, and a problem right for some people or or needing a solution from from other folks and so I think that it's really important that we're doing all of these things in order to make sure that we're bridging those gaps and then communicating that in 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 the storytelling way is just so beautiful and builds so many bridges and is so great at making sure that we can constantly network with one another in a meaningful way and also be able to communicate what we want to communicate. So 
if you have any questions, I know again, like I am not the best public speaker, but I will make sure to be able to, um, you know, stay for the forum. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask later. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think your your um, presentation on, on networking and and just gathering support around a piece of legislation like predatory lending is outstanding. And if there are any young people uh, among our, our uh, participants today, I mean, that's extremely great advice um, for them to take, for all of us to take. Um, and as well, uh, Sharon Tamiko Santos and Uncle Bob Santos were early mentors of mine as well. I've had many memorable conversations with Uncle Bob and some of the original gang of four at the Bush Garden back in the early days. So, so thank you for bringing up right, those names. You're the karaoke host. Yes. Oh, you were. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll bring up that conversation at a future time here. <laughs> well, it, Lynn, are, are you back on? Are you able to hear me? Oh, yeah. Oh, would, would wonderful. You, would you like to continue your... <laughs> sure, if you like me to, although I'm still not able to see everybody because of the technical challenges that I'm facing with. But, you know, things have to continue. So I'm yes, going to go does. ahead and introduce... Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn, are you there still? <laughs> Hello? Okay, I, I, we, we might have lost Lynn again here. So um, I can introduce the next speaker. Um, our, our next presentation is Claiming Your Space. It is done by Dr. Myung Park, who I know because she's a former colleague of mine at Pierce College or when I still worked at Pierce College. Mm -hmm. um, she is the executive director of the International Education at Pierce College for the Pierce College District. Prior to Pierce College, uh, Young was an executive director of global programs and partnerships at the Lake Washington Institute of Technology. Uh, she is a dedicated higher ed strategic leader with a record of building and expanding international education at the Lake Washington Institute of Technology. Um, uh, Meng's mission is to empower people to see possibilities and be the change they want to see in the world. She values integrity, autonomy, and social justice. Myung has a, a doctorate degree in higher education leadership from Seattle University and a master's in business administration from the City University of Seattle. Uh, she's married to a loving, dedicated husband and has a daughter and a son. Uh, she is involved with people by actively serving the board of community service organizations. And in her spare time, she travels and loves to hike. So without further hesitation, I'd like to introduce Dr. Myung Park. Thank you, Brian. And it's good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> You know, um, public speaking is not easy, like uh, Representative Ryu said, and I took a lot of notes from uh, Representative Taylor's. But, you know, public speaking online is harder. But what one thing that I found out today is that public speaking after all those great speakers are the hardest. Now, I somehow get to be that lucky person today, but I'll do my best to see what I can. Let me share my screen. Let me open it up. There. Today I am asked to speak about claiming the space. So when I heard um, or when I hear the space, what came to um, me uh, is that is it a physical space that I need? Or is it a mental space I need? Or is it an emotional space I need? But whichever it means, I think space is a relative term. Like somebody said, 
space, um, the life expands or shrinks depending on how you perceive yourself. What is your perception about the world? So this is the famous um, pictures that you can Google. So in this picture, what do you see? Do I see myself as a cat or do I see myself as a lion? I oftentimes tend to see lion in me, but I am very hard working cat, but I hope to see lion in me someday soon. So before we can claim our space, uh, we need to define, define our space. So is that the space that we feel um, that we need it to be safe as a whole person where we don't have to be bicultural? Bicultural means is that you, you, you code switch. Because when you're home, you follow your heritage, heritage culture, but when you're at work, you follow that mainstream culture we do become a bicultural because we want to respond to the social um, discrimination against, against socially minoritized culture. And also we want to respect our heritage culture. Or is that the space that you want to have a bigger pro promotional space? Is that a pr promotion that you are looking for? And do you feel that you're not treated well enough compared to your ability and your um, contribution to the work. I often had felt that. So um, space is, um, like I said, space depends on how you see. Is that the shadow you see or is that the small cat you see? But to see the space, um, we have to do three things as we grow up. First, we learn to stand up. Some wise men once told me that you need to stand up on your own to fit to be, your first, to be yourself first. But it is not the weight of the things that makes us fall, or it is not the um, things that, that interfere us standing up. It is all about our balancing within ourselves. If you find your balance, you know how to stand still on your two feet. So to stand up yourself, um, you need to think about what does, let me talk to myself first. To stand up strong, be a bicultural person in America, I had to often think about what does my heart say about me as a bicultural person? What do I really want? What do I really value? What makes me respect myself? What does, what makes me get excited? So like um, to center, to stand strong, I had to find my true center as a person and as a leader in the organization. And, that wise man also said is that when you uh, are able to stand up on your feet, you need to stand tall as well. So when you're centered, you, are, you found your balance. And when you're balanced, you don't fall easily. I said easily because we still will fall once in a while, once here, once there, but we will still find our center again and then we will stand up again. So we should feel confident because we know they were centered and balanced. So we should feel confident in ourselves and we should feel confident about making decisions and taking actions for us because our decisions are grounded on our need and, and values that respect us and respect others. I say it is respect others as well. You cannot be uh, centered, on, centered on your needs only because we are the community members. So if you want to be the community members, you need to respect others as well. So we know where we, we should know where we belong and then we should know what is the rightful space for us as well. 
Here I found this uh, by Googling as well. When you know how to uh, stand up and stand tall, now it is the time to spread your wings out. So we need to come out of our comfort zone because I always, um, I've been immigrated to America and for first 15 years, I kept myself within the safety zone that I created to be safe and then not to make any waves like my parents told us. And most um, a a API people, we are cultured not to make waves because we're often told to be quiet, keep your heads down and do not make any waves. So, so I've done that for first 15 years. But I learned that, um, that I am more than that. And then when my rights are not respected, I learned to speak up as well. So when someone told me that you will never be able to do that, or you shouldn't do that because we know you can't. When I oftentimes heard that, even, um, even when I applied for my doctoral degree, doctoral program, I was 53. People said, oh, you shouldn't. Your brain's already not working. You can't get the um, degree at this point. But I chose to do it because so that I know that I tried, even if I fail during the process, I wanted to try. So I did. And then I finished it. Uh, com I completed it successfully. Because I know that whenever I am told that you shouldn't do this, I hard enough to ignore until I figure it out what's right for me. Am I really not capable? Am I, should I not do that? But until I find the answer um, myself, I tend not to give up because I take their advice, but it is me that I have to decide what's right for me. So I am asking people um, not to, because oftentimes people push me and then try to define me by the competition that I'm not the first place. I only place in the third place, fifth place. Competition is good, but I tend not to let the competition define myself. So my, this is, um, this one, has, uh, I always put it on my screen. Every morning I wake up, I always read, what do I need today? What do I want today? What makes me respect myself today? This is my um, questions. Like if you go to the Rotary, there's four way, there's four way uh, test before you act. They ask four questions. And this is my questions that every morning I um, ask myself to remind myself. And um, most important thing that to me is that I always uh, think about what do I, what makes me respect today? What would make me feel good today? And people say that uh, respect is the complete form of love. Because my dad passed away when I was nine and he knew that he was going to, he was going to pass because he was critically ill. And the doctor already told him a year to leave, but he extended and extended. So he knew every day he could be gone. So, and then I was only nine. What, what do you tell your nine-year-old kid? So what he told me is that, Myung, you should love yourself. If not, nobody will. So he, that was the simple message my dad gave me when I was nine. So maybe that's where my uh, confidence comes from. My husband oftentimes tells me that, you know, where's your confidence comes from? That uh, baseless confidence. He says that there's no ground for your confidence, but you look confident. I think that's the confidence uh, that I found by accepting me as who I am and then by loving me. And then today I want to discuss how I love myself. Love um, is, when I attended one seminar, they talked about love. And then I modified a little bit because I really liked it. Love is listening to yourself. And love is, is observing what's around, what's happening around you and what's not happening around you. And um, when, you, oh, when you look around, 
you look around and see, am I respectfully situated to be whole person? I don't have to be one or the other. I have, I can be one and the. So am I situated? Am I uh, capable enough? Do I have enough power to fulfill my potential? So once I observe, I need to validate myself. And then so I learned to value my intersecting racial and cultural identity of myself. So when someone tells me again that I, I should never be able to do that, I ask myself first before I give in to others. And then once you listened and once you observed and once you validate, you need to empower yourself. Are you empowered enough to encourage others to give you the space that you deserve? Or it's better to um, encourage, to create the shared space. We're trying to create our own space, but at the end of the day, we want to educate others to share the space we, we all have together. So um, after all, because I, I had a, a little more things to speak, but I mean, uh, my previous speakers said everything good about it. So um, I cut my PowerPoint presentation while I was listening to you to uh, shorten it. So the message I want to give it to you, because you're all leaders, you're all current leaders, or you're, uh, you're leaders to be. So there are three leaders that you should become. One, you need to lead your own life. So you need to find leader in you first. And then you need to find yourself leading the community. What are you leading the organization? And then if you still have capacity that you need to find a way to lead the world. To do that, this is my theme. I want to love myself. And then I want to live my full capacity. And I want to let others live their full capacity as well. So to do that, I have three steps that I always remind myself is to stand up on what I believe in and say no by saying yes to my priority. It is not easy for me to say no to others because again, I grew up in Korea until 25 and then the Confucius culture in Korea at that time told us not to say no. You should suck it up and then just do it for others. So it was not in my nature. So it was hard for me to say no to others. But when I read a book, it said that say no by saying yes to yourself. So it made me easier to say no because I'm not saying no, I am saying yes to me. And then once I do know that, then I need to stand up, stand tall to expand my space, not uh, to not to put it in, put it in, um, put myself in a box. I want to come out of my box to see what's out there, what's beyond the fence. And then I feel confident in making my decisions and taking actions because I found my center. That's um, what's in my in my center, what I need to be myself. But I also learn to respect others as well. So I think my decision and in my action is pretty fair. So that's why I feel confident in making um, decisions. Then, um, like I said, I immigrated about 34 years ago. And then I had to spend most of my 30 years to be myself and stand up and then I, I stood up. But now that I am close to retirement, I am hoping to retire next year because my theme is that I want to work 30 years and then I want to spend 30 years spending all I made and all I earned. So uh, that is next year. So what I want to do is that I want to stand out now for other people. And then I, I want to, because now I have a voice and then I have a firm ground for people. So I want to you know, go out and encourage others to create the space. So my daughters, my sons do not have to struggle as much as I did. 
So I want to be proactive. So, so far I was always responding to the situation, but now I want to change from being a response, responsive to be proactive. So I want to see if I can expand the spaces for me and then others as well. And I want to persevere in opposition of oppression. And one, one of my president, most of my president that I served told me that I am very tenacious. And then I take that as a compliment because once I have my mindset, I don't give up. Some people say that, how do you not give up? And I say that is that it is, you win the world by 2%, not by a lot. You can fall 49 times, but if you stand up at the fifth time and then stand, continue standing up 51 times, you're the winner. That's my philosophy. So I do it until I say that I, I've done enough. So let's see. So I love uh, this Lion King. This is the this is the only thing or it's the best thing I got out of my doctoral degree. Because when they talked about the leadership, they always um, brought this Lion King. Do you see this Lion King? All those characters are there. What do you want to be? Do you want to be Mufasa? Mufasa is the one who shared, who creates the vision because he sees his kingdom. Or do you want to be the Simba? Simba challenged the process. Simba says, ha, daddy, you told me not to cross this line, but let me see if I can cross it. So Simba does it. Or do you want to be uh, Rafiki, the monkey you see? That he is the one who brought Simba back to the leadership because he's the one, he's, it says that you can run from your mistakes, but, or you can learn from mis your mistakes. So Rafiki is the one who um, puts potential leaders to see their potential. So you can be that type of leader or you can be Lala. Lala becomes um, Simba's wife in the future. So Lala is good to remind uh, Simba that he is more than he has become. So you can be that type of leader as well. Or the, the one I like is you can be Pumba. Pumba says that life is good. Don't worry, be happy. But most important, he says that when uh, Simba was trying to go to his own kingdom, Pumbaa did not know what life would be like if they, he joins that uh, kingdom. But he says, friend, if it matters to you, it matters to me. So he follows Simba. So there's a lot of leaders uh, in the Lion King. So you can choose to be what type of a leader you want to be, or you can be all five. So that's all I have to share today because I mean, we already have a, a lot of great stuff that's said before, before me and it has been a great joy and an honor to join you today to share what I believe the leadership should be. And thank you.